Book Five, Chapters Eight and Nine of A Hero of Our Time by Mikhail Yurovich Lermontov, translated by Mar Murray and J. H. Wisdom. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Kevin Davidson. Chapter Eight, Eleventh June. I often ask myself. Why am I so obstinately endeavoring to win the love of a young girl whom I do not wish to deceive and whom I will never marry? Why this woman-like coquetry? Vera loves me more than Princess Mary ever will. Had I regarded the latter as an invincible beauty, I should perhaps have been allured by the difficulty of the undertaking. However, there is no such difficulty in this case. Consequently, my present feeling is not that restless craving for love which torments us in the early days of our youth, flinging us from one woman to another until we find one who cannot endure us. And then begins our constancy, that sincere unending passion which may be expressed mathematically by a line falling from a point into space. The secret of that endless lying only in the impossibility of attaining the aim, that is to say, the end. From what motive, then, am I taking all this trouble? Envy of Gruznitsky? Poor fellow! He is quite undeserving of it, or is it the result of that ugly but invincible feeling which causes us to destroy the sweet illusions of our neighbor in order to have the petty satisfaction of saying to him, when in despair he asks what is he to believe, My friend, the same thing happened to me, and you see, nevertheless, that I dine, sup, and sleep very peacefully, and I shall, I hope, know how to die without tears and lamentations. There is, in sooth, a boundless enjoyment in the possession of a young, scarce-bundled soul. It is like a floweret, which exhales its best perfume at the kiss of the first ray of the sun. You should pluck the flower at that moment, and, breathing its fragrance to the full, cast it upon the road. Perchance someone will pick it up. I feel within me that insatiable hunger, which devours everything it meets upon the way. I look upon the sufferings and joys of others only from the point of view of their relation to myself, regarding them as the nutriment which sustains my spiritual forces. I myself am no longer capable of committing follies under the influence of passion. With me ambition has been repressed by circumstances, but it has emerged in another form, because ambition is nothing more or less than a thirst for power and my chief pleasure is to make everything that surrounds me subject to my will. To arouse the feeling of love, devotion, and awe towards oneself, is not that the first sign and the greatest triumph of power? To be the cause of suffering and joy to another, without in the least possessing any definite right to be so, is not that the sweetest food for our pride? And what is happiness? Satisfied pride. Were I to consider myself the best, the most powerful man in the world, I should be happy, were all to love me. I should find within me inexhaustible springs of love. Evil begets evil. The first suffering gives us the conception of the satisfaction of torturing another. The idea of evil cannot enter the mind without arousing a desire to put it actually into practice. Ideas are organic entities, someone has said. The very fact of their birth endows them with form, and that form is action. He in whose brain the most ideas are born accomplishes the most. From that cause a genius, chained to an official desk, must die or go mad, just as it often happens that a man of powerful constitution at the same time of sedentary life and simple habits, dies of an apoplectic stroke. Passions are naught but ideas in their first development. They are an attribute of the youth of the heart, and foolish is he who thinks that he will be agitated by them all his life. Many quiet rivers begin their course as noisy waterfalls, and there is not a single stream which will leap or foam throughout its way to the sea. That quietness, however, is frequently the sign of great, though latent, strength. 
The fullness and depth of feelings and thoughts do not admit of frenzied outbursts. In suffering and enjoyment the soul renders itself a strict account of all it experiences, and convinces itself that such things must be. It knows that, but for storms, the constant heat of the sun would dry it up. It imbues itself with its own life, pets and punishes itself like a favorite child. It is only in that highest state of self-knowledge that a man can appreciate the divine justice. On reading over this page, I observe that I have made a wide digression from my subject. But what the matter? You see, it is for myself that I am writing this diary, and consequently anything that I jot down in it will, in time, be a valuable reminiscence for me. Grusnitsky has called to see me today. He flung himself upon my neck. He has been promoted to be an officer. We drank champagne. Dr. Werner came in after him. I do not congratulate you, he said to Grusnitsky. Why not? Because the soldier's cloak suits you very well. And you must confess that an infantry uniform, made by one of the local tailors, will not add anything of interest to you. Do you not see? Hitherto you have been an exception, but now you will come under the general rule. Talk away, doctor, talk away. You will not prevent me from rejoicing. He does not know, added Grusnitsky in a whisper to me, how many hopes these epaulets have lent me. Oh, epaulets, epaulets, your little stars are guiding stars. No, I am perfectly happy now. Are you coming with us on our walk to the hollow? I asked him. I? Not on any account will I show myself to Princess Mary until my uniform is finished. Would you like me to inform her of your happiness? No, please, not a word. I want to give her a surprise. Tell me, though, how are you getting on with her? He became embarrassed and fell into thought. He would gladly have bragged and told lies, but his conscience would not let him and at the same time he was ashamed to confess the truth. What do you think? Does she love you? Love me? Good gracious, Pechorin, what ideas you have! How could she possibly love me so soon? And a well-bred woman, even if she is in love, will never say so. Very well, and I suppose, in your opinion, a well-bred man should also keep silence in regard to his passion? Ah, my dear fellow, there are ways of doing everything. Often things may remain unspoken, but yet may be guessed. That is true. But the love which we read in the eyes does not pledge a woman to anything. Whilst words, have a care, Gruznitsky, she is befooling you. She, he answered, raising his eyes heavenward and smiling complacently. I am sorry for you, Piechorin. He took his departure. In the evening a numerous company set off to walk to the hollow, in the opinion of the learned Pyatyagorsk, the hollow in question is nothing more or less than an extinct crater. It is situated on a slope of Mount Mashuk, at the distance of a versch from the town, and is approached by a narrow path between brushwood and rocks. In climbing up the hill, I gave Princess Mary my arm, and she did not leave it during the whole excursion. Our conversation commenced with slander. I proceeded to pass in review our present and absent acquaintances. At first I exposed their ridiculous and then their bad sides. My collar rose. I began in jest and ended in genuine malice. At first she was amused, but afterwards frightened. You are a dangerous man, she said. I would rather perish in the woods under the knife of an assassin than under your tongue. In all earnestness, I beg of you, when it comes to your mind to speak evil of me, take a knife instead and cut my throat. I think you would not find that a very difficult matter. Am I like an assassin, then? You are worse. I fell into thought for a moment, then, assuming a deeply moved air, I said, Yet such has been my lot from very childhood. All have read upon my countenance the marks of bad qualities which were not existent but they were assumed to exist, and they were born. I was modest. I was accused of slyness. I grew secretive. I profoundly felt both good and evil. No one caressed me. All insulted me. I grew vindictive. I was gloomy. 
other children merry and talkative. I felt myself higher than they. I was rated lower. I grew envious. I was prepared to love the whole world. No one understood me. I learned to hate. My colorless youth flowed by in conflict with myself and the world. Fearing ridicule, I buried my best feelings in the depths of my heart, and there they died. I spoke the truth. I was not believed. I began to deceive. Having acquired a thorough knowledge of the world and the springs of society, I grew skilled in the science of life, and I saw how others without skill were happy, enjoying gratuitously the advantages which I so unweariedly sought. Then despair was born within my breast, not that despair which is cured at the muzzle of a pistol, but the cold, powerless despair concealed beneath the mask of amiability and a good-natured smile. I became a moral cripple. One half of my soul ceased to exist. It dried up, evaporated, died, and I cut it off and cast it from me. The other half moved and lived at the service of all, but it remained unobserved, because no one knew that the half which had perished had ever existed. But now the memory of it has been awakened within me by you, and I have read you its epitaph. To many epitaphs in general seem ridiculous, but to me they do not, especially when I remember what reposes beneath them. I will not, however, ask you to share my opinion. If this outburst seems absurd to you, I pray you laugh. I forewarn you that your laughter will not cause me the least chagrin. At that moment I met her eyes. Tears were welling in them. Her arm, as it leaned upon mine, was trembling. Her cheeks were aflame. She pitied me. Sympathy, a feeling to which all women yield so easily, had dug its talons into her inexperienced heart. During the whole excursion she was preoccupied and did not flirt with any one, and that is a great sign. We arrived at the hollow. The ladies left their cavaliers, but she did not let go of my arm. The witticisms of the local dandies failed to make her laugh. The steepness of the declivity beside which she was standing caused her no alarm, although the other ladies uttered shrill cries and shut their eyes. On the way back I did not renew our melancholy conversation, but to my idle questions and jests she gave short and absent-minded answers. "'Have you ever been in love?' I asked her at length. She looked at me intently, shook her head, and fell into a reverie. It was evident that she was wishing to say something, but she did not know how to begin. Her breast heaved, and indeed that was but natural. A muslin sleeve is a weak protection, and an electric spark was running from my arm to hers. Almost all passions have their beginnings in that way, and frequently we are very much deceived in thinking that a woman loves us for our moral and physical merits. Of course, these prepare and predispose the heart for the reception of the holy flame, but for all that it is the first touch that decides the matter. "'I have been very amiable today, have I not?' Princess Mary said to me, with a forced smile, when we had returned from the walk. We separated. She is dissatisfied with herself. She accuses herself of coldness. Oh, that is the first, the chief triumph. Tomorrow she will be feeling a desire to recompense me. I know the whole proceeding by heart already. That is what is so tiresome. Chapter 9 Twelfth June I have seen Vera today. She has begun to plague me with her jealousy. Princess Mary has taken it into her head, it seems, to confide the secrets of her heart to Vera. A happy choice, it must be confessed. "'I can guess what all this is leading to,' said Vera to me. "'You had better simply tell me at once that you are in love with her.' "'But supposing I am not in love with her. "'Then why run after her, disturb her, agitate her imagination? "'Oh, I know you well. "'If you wish me to believe you, Come to Kislovodsk in a week's time. We shall be moving thither the day after tomorrow. Princess Mary will remain here longer. Engage lodgings next door to us. We shall be living in the large house near the spring on the mezzanine floor. 
Princess Ligovsky will be below us, and the next door there is a house, belonging to the same landlord, which has not yet been taken. Will you come? I gave my promise, and this very same day I have sent to engage the lodgings. Gruznitsky came to me at six o'clock and announced that his uniform would be ready tomorrow, just in time for him to go to the ball in it. At last I shall dance with her the whole evening through, and then I shall talk to my heart's content, he added. When is the ball? Why, tomorrow. Do you not know, then? A great festival, and the local authorities have undertaken to organize it. Let us go to the boulevard. Not on any account, in this nasty cloak. What, have you ceased to love it? I went out alone, and, meeting Princess Mary, I asked her to keep the mazurka for me. She seemed surprised and delighted. I thought that you would only dance from necessity, as on the last occasion, she said with a very charming smile. She does not seem to notice Gruznitsky's absence at all. You will be agreeably surprised tomorrow, I said to her. At what? That is a secret. You will find it out yourself at the ball. I finished up the evening at Princess Ligovsky's. There were no other guests present except Vera and a certain very amusing little old gentleman. I was in good spirits and improvised various extraordinary stories. Princess Mary sat opposite to me and listened to my nonsense with such deep, strained, and even tender attention that I grew ashamed of myself. What had become of her vivacity, her coquetry, her caprices, her haughty mane, her contemptuous smile, her absent-minded glance? Vera noticed nothing, and her sickly countenance was a picture of profound grief. She was sitting in the shadow by the window buried in a wide armchair. I pitied her. Then I related the whole dramatic story of our acquaintanceship, our love, concealing it all, of course, under fictitious names. So vividly did I portray my tenderness, my anxieties, my raptures. In so favorable a light did I exhibit her actions and her character that involuntarily she had to forgive me for my flirtation with Princess Mary. She rose, sat down beside us, and brightened up and it was only at two o'clock in the morning that we remembered that the doctors had ordered her to go to bed at eleven. End of Book 5, Chapters 8 and 9 Recording by Kevin Davidson www.blogordie.com